Okay. Hello, folks. Welcome. My name is Ash. I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective, and I am very excited to be hosting tonight's discussion between Esteban Kelly and Rebecca Suber about the recent release of Rebecca's new book, When to Talk and When to Fight, The Strategic Choice Between Dialogue and Resistance. Uh, for folks joining an event with us for the first time, Firestorm Books and Coffee is a 13-year-old worker-owned cooperative and radical bookstore in so-called Asheville, North Carolina, on occupied Cherokee territory. Our bookstore features a wide selection of general interest titles and political thought highlighting queer, feminist, and anarchist voices and culture. Um, our entire catalog is available for purchase on our website. So if you haven't checked us out yet, I highly encourage that you do. And I will drop links to the website in the chat. Uh, Firestorm is also an event space, but since the start of the pandemic, we've transitioned to an online virtual space and will continue hosting virtual events like the one you're attending tonight through the end of the year. Tonight's event was also organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press. Uh, PM Press is a radical publisher that we've been collaborating with on a series of, ev of events since the start of 2021. All of those events uh, we've held with PM can be viewed on our YouTube page, and there is lots of great content there, ranging from conversations on community self-defense to the Kurdish freedom movement to workers' power and alternative education. Um, so if you'd like to check those out, I will also drop links to the YouTube channel in the chat. And thanks again to PM Press for collaborating on tonight's event. One last note, uh, there will be some time at the end of the event uh, for audience Q&A. So for folks who are attending through Zoom, I'll encourage you to submit questions throughout the discussion tonight by using the Q&A function located at the bottom of your screen. Um, and our speakers will do their best to respond by the end of the event. Okay, great. Like I said before, tonight's event features a discussion between Esteban Kelly and Rebecca Subar about Rebecca's new book, When to Talk and When to Fight, The, Str the Strategic Choice Between Dialogue and Resistance. Rebecca Suber taught peace and conflict studies at Westchester University from 2005 to 2019. She's a senior partner at Dragonfly, where a multiracial band of consultants supports organizations that make social change. She has coached leaders of political advocacy groups, large and small, on their race consciousness, their organization's growth, and their strategy for changing the world. When to Talk and When to Fight introduces a new language to enable activists to argue and collaborate across different schools of thought and action. Uh, threaded among examples of conflict, struggle, and change in organizations, communities, and society is the compelling personal story that led Rebecca to her current work of advising leaders in social justice organizations on organizational and advocacy strategy. Esteban Kelly is the executive director for the US Federation of Worker Cooperatives, of which Firestorm is a proud member, um, and is a founding member of AORDA, a worker-owned co-op whose facilitation supports organizations fighting for social, change, social justice and solidarity economy. He received a Social Innovation Award for Public Policy, is an advisor to the Movement for Black Lives Policy Table, and offers one of two introductions to Rebecca's book. Uh, so Rebecca Esteban, thank you so much for being here tonight and taking the time to talk with us about the release of this important book and the nuanced conversa conversation that goes along with it. Uh, and now I'm gonna go ahead and hand it over to Esteban. 
Awesome. Thanks so much, Ash. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you all this evening. I, I'm actually not going to say that much right now. I'm going to kick it to Rebecca to uh, actually introduce the book itself. Um, thanks so much, Rebecca, for inviting me <laughs> to pen one of the introductions. Of course, you had to break all the rules and the mold and have two of us <laughs> write an intro. Um, but um, I think that's why I'm here. It's not just because uh, this event was put on by one of our members um, and and our friends at PM Press, um, but uh, but because of the work that you and I have done. So maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit. But I, I actually wanted to start by let's hear let's hear from the boss lady herself. That would be great, Esteban, if we talk about some of the work that that we've done together. Um, Ash, thank you. That's nice, Esteban. I like it. Um, if you're going to buy the book tonight, buy it from Firestorm. They're a worker co-op. That's amazing. Um, I really appreciate all of you being here. I'm just looking through the list of attendees. Most of you I don't know. Many of you I do know. And I'm just delighted that you have an interest in the book. Um, the reason that there were two forward writers, as you know, Esteban, was because the book is about kind of a binary thing, you know? It's about when to talk and when to fight. And um, I wanted you to be the fighter, but you kind of resisted being the fighter, but you did speak for the place of fighters, right? You spoke in your writing about movement space. Um, and the other introducer, Doug Stone spoke about negotiation space. And the book, more than anything else, is approbation, is sort of a, a finger wagging at people who talk, negotiate, like dialogue, but don't notice when the power balance tells us that only fighting will make any change happen. And it's a finger wagging at people in movement space or anywhere else where groups fight to reprimand us. I didn't know until right now that it was approbation and reprimand, but it's kind of fun to think of it that way, um, which is a reminder that when we win a space at the table, we need to sit at the table. You're good at sitting at the table, Esteban, but you're also your home base. Um, being in movement space is the voice that I appreciate here. So what is the relationship between talkers and fighters? You'll read the book and you'll find out, but I'll say right now that um, throughout the book, there are a number of stories. There is a bunch of um, narrative, the first two chapters in the book for you fiction appreciators are indeed uh, personal narrative, memoir form, that introduces some of the conundrum of my life, some of the stories of my life that led to me seeing things, sort of having a pathology of seeing things from multiple perspectives. It's and all a true story. It's not fiction. Yes. <laughs> it's autobiographical. It's autobiographical. And the shortest possible story of way to tell the story of my life is that I used to be at some point in my life, a wife of an Orthodox rabbi living on an illegal Jewish settlement in the Gaza Strip. And at another point in my life, now um, a different thing. I'm a queer 61 year old white. Butch. Middle class. Oh, thanks. <laughs> you, you, you use that language in that. In the oh, first no, I'm just saying it's funny because we're so like we, we self identify, but you're right. Butch. <laughs> I am a butch. Uh, secular Jew. Other things. Um, able-bodied person who rarely wears polka dots, but is wearing them for special tonight. And um, 
so I have this pathology of seeing things like having to see things from multiple perspectives because there are beloved people to me um, who sit on multiple sides, particularly of the Palestine Israel conundrum, which is featured in chapter nine of my book and on multiple sides of many other conflicts that matter to me. Um, what I want to read to you is a selection that my eldest child selected for me. She is the poet Nava at Shalom, and um, she sent me an amazing video while I was writing the book. She said, hey, here's a fantastic fight. This guy lays out your book better than Martin Luther King did. You included King's piece. Include this guy's piece too, okay? This is me speaking in the book and introducing John Samuelson. In this lively 2019 confrontation between management and workers, John Samuelson, president of the Transit Workers Union International, spared no venom in telling the president of American Airlines that AA's mechanics refused to give up their benefits. And here's John Samuelson. I stand here to tell you in front of this whole room, in front of everybody, anybody who's listening, that you're not gonna get what you want. And if this erupts into the bloodiest, ugliest battle that the United States labor movement ever saw, that's what's gonna happen. You're already profitable enough. You compare your profit level to United, you compare it to Delta, start thinking about your own workforce. Don't think about where you're at in terms of profitability relative to other airlines in the industry. Three billion bucks and you're looking for more concessions? And these concessions are off our backs. That's simply not happening. And you said a very interesting point before about mediation, negotiation, but perhaps we'll get to a point where there's unilateral terms set by management. And I'll leave you with this. If we ever get to that point, we're gonna engage in absolutely vicious strike action against American Airlines, the likes of which you've never seen. Not organized by airline people, but organized by a guy that came out of the New York City subway system that's well inclined to strike power and who understands that the only way to challenge power is to aggressively take it to them. Back to me speaking. It was not a loving exchange, but Samuelson does a whiz bang job of highlighting the best of what talk and action can do when they're part of a unified strategy. Among unions, there is a range of socio-political orientations. Not all unions are trying to change the social and economic relations of the country, but their theories of change share the doctrine that workers united have power, that the power of the united workers, AKA the power of the union when exercised against management can yield gains for the workers, that the union can calibrate the increased power needed to win at the bargaining table, and that like a bellows, Building power and bargaining are the inhale and exhale of a group facing power and in search of change. And that's the core of the book. I describe four factors that inf tend to influence groups as they decide whether to talk or fight. And um, I describe nine types of social change characters who may be, for example, perennial fighters who find themselves in uh, a fight regardless of how much power they have and regardless of the factors that I've just described. Um, and, and then woven in are stories and, and this is uh, the core of the story of the book. Is that a good start, Esteban? Yeah, it definitely is. Um, I'm... And uh, so, some of what you just teased out, um, or a lot of what you just teased out in terms of um, those tensions, those kind of cornerstones of what it is that you're, what the framework is and what that tool is that, um, that you're trying to share with movements um, is, is peppered with that autobiographical. So it, most of those stories that you just teased are, are fleshed out in the book, um, including, yeah, including some of the BDS stuff that maybe we'll talk about in, in a moment. Um, I want to lift up one of the things that you say early on in the book is, and I want to make sure that we're clear about this here, that you're, 
maybe I'm checking if this is true, that you're, you're actually somewhat agnostic, right? As to whether like one is privileged over the other um, or your diagnosis about our, our movements generally, um, that you're sort of submitting this as like, look, I'm not saying you need to be more naturally one or the other, or that you need to balance out whatever. I'm just saying, here's a tool. <laughs> here's something that I've noticed that's based on patterns and deep work and observation over, uh, you mentioned like 40 plus years of, of doing this work. Um, and um, and so, yeah, just s staying, that, staying that up front. It's not like there's a secret that once you get to the end, we find out that secretly you just think we should all talk through our problems. <laughs> um, so yeah. yeah, but my my first question is, are you trying to get groups to change the way they organize? And um, if if not, then how, yeah, what's, what is that, is that what you're trying to do through the book? Kind of. Um, the main purpose of the book, even though I lied a few minutes ago and said the main purpose of the book, I, I thought I had a really great new frame in the moment, which was that I'm like beating people over the head so the talkers let go of their talking bias and fighters let go of their fighting bias. That is one of the key things that happens in the book. But I appreciate the question because that admonition is there in the service of a model. And the model, and there are a lot of graphics here by Rosie Greenberg, who wasn't able to be with us tonight, but she's quite a remarkable illustrator. And mm -hmm. um, if you can see this, right, the core of the model is what I just described or John Samuelson and Martin Luther King both described, right? Which we're probably all familiar with, which is a, a sort of loop of building power. And then with that power, joint consensual activity that might be problem solving, being able to get wins in negotiation. And of course, it's a much more complex model than that, but that's at the core of the model is column A, uh, joint consensual activity like negotiation and column B, which is um, unilateral non-consensual activity that a group does at another group. And um, the, the voice speaking to people in movement space is the voice of here is a model to understand um, how other groups, how we can interpret groups that we are looking at um, we can interpret the, the choice, we can infer, we can figure out backwards how they have made certain decisions that they've made based on the four factors that I alluded to earlier, which are power, structural barriers, principle, and biases or inclinations that a group might have. And it's that last one, inclinations and biases, that I'm very eager for people who are social change makers to pay attention to, which is do we make our choices about when to talk and when to fight using our best strategic brain? Do we pay attention? Of course we pay attention to power, but it, in what moments do we misinterpret, misjudge, misdecide because of biases that we bring in? For example, one should always fight or one should always fight this type of group or here's the sequence the talking and fighting should go in. Whatever. Or sitting down and meeting with management or the, the whatever city official after you've been demonstrating and building up power for uh, weeks or months of a campaign is a, is a concession. That's conceding defeat to sit down and have that culminate in a power brokering conversation, which is one of the, I think, cultural assumptions or biases that sort of bedded, embedded um, and I think what's interesting is that you are just, you're naming something that is sort of implicit in a lot of movements that we don't necessarily talk about. It's not like someone sits you down and is like, this is what we do and don't do or do or, or don't value, which is what, what you mean by implicit biases, right? And so it's just helpful having that named and articulated like, oh, wait, we have options and it means we can make smarter choices if we're just aware of the assumptions that we bring, um, including the inherent value um, for, for fighting. Um, and maybe that brings me to my next question, but what were you going to oh, say? Oh, great. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask, would you say you're more of a talker or a fighter? Me personally? Yeah. Well, I love the question because I, so in all over the book, I'm like, oh, I'm both. I'm both. It's true. I am both. I'm very fiercely both, you know, like, pers you know, like personality tests or like what mm. type are you at work or like Myers-Briggs or this and that, you know how like they're always like you're an F or a P or a T or a mm -hmm. 
And some people are like, I'm both. And you're like, no, don't be both. We're going to force your choice. You have to be one or the other. But I wrote the book and I'm both. Um, and that's why I wrote it because I didn't understand yeah, dude. myself. High five. I, I, I wanted <laughs> to understand, you know, I was like sitting in a class in graduate school in an organizing class. Some of you know Marshall Gans it was in his organizing class. And that same semester, I was taking lots of negotiation classes because that's why I'd gone to graduate school to learn negotiation skills, international negotiation skills in particular, international conflict and stuff like that. And I was sitting in that organizing class and I was like, I don't know how to form, and I, this is in the book, right? I, I don't know how to form a sentence that incorporates the learning from organizing school and the learning from negotiation school. I can't actually, I don't have mm -hmm. a theory that explains the relationship between these two things. I do mm -hmm. have that basic mo column A, column B model, but the people who were actually experts in column A mm. and in column B don't talk to each other. Worlds apart. Worlds <laughs> apart, right? And politically worlds apart. And so I was eager to bring the expertise, the knowledge, the practice from people who were really good at negotiating to movement space. And similarly, and I think this might be one of the most important goals that I had in writing the book, I am very eager for graduate schools that teach negotiation <laughs> to never teach a negotiation course where there is no analysis of power. If it's if it, it, to the extent that they touch, and how does that even point. happen? Like how how <laughs> how is it even possible to teach a negotiation class without a power analysis? Hello. <sighs> mm. So here's something funny about that. There might be a power analysis, right? There might be a power. Let's say it's like business school thing, and they're trying to teach you like you know here's my walk away. You don't want to like give in. Blah blah blah. Stuff that's Leverage. about power. Yeah. What's that? Leverage. leverage leverage isn't that about power right it's totally about power but the way that negotiation you know the the way that it's set up is that the power analysis is there so that you know how to negotiate better and if you need to walk away then not walk away and do the other thing but what there isn't and there's a story about this in the book about um, some negotiators who I did some training with. And we were in Palestine working with Palestinian trainers. We did co-training on a bunch of stuff. And in this instance, I was doing a training together with two U.S. people of a bunch of Palestinian political actors, leaders. And um, we did a lot of talking in, in the circles with the Palestinian political actors that we were working with about um, their fighting, the different things that they did that was like not negotiation, right? And when we got back and we did a debrief, I was like, you know, Every time we talked about fighting, we left it to them as though, okay, but that's your piece. We're here to talk about the negotiation. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And I was like, you know, I wear another hat, which is like, I know something about social change movements. I'm not an, I, I personally don't think of myself as an organizer. I work with organizers. I support organizers to strategize. I personally am not really much of an organizer, but I know something about organizing strategy and change making strategy leveraging power and sometimes wanting to like vanquish the other which is part of the model too right we have column a and column b and we also have column c which is also problem solving but the problem solving exactly what you just right destroying the power of the other or working hard to do it and none of that is in the negotiation models, right? Mm. And so we lose so much power if our goal is really to reach our goal and our bias tells us that we can use this set of tools, but we can't use this one. 
So you need a principal lens, right? You need to make sure that you're only using tools that you feel right in using. And I'm completely agnostic about what tools are right to use. You have to have your own, right? Because some of you are like, going to want to talk about that. I don't know. I talk a lot about it, but I don't talk about which ones are right or wrong. I talk about how you think about which ones are right and wrong. Right. I mean, one of the things that jumped out to me um, reading the book was um, I had a memory of the first time that I uh, noticed you using this weird magic. And part of why I'm so excited about that book is the book. And I, I kind of allude to this in my intro was like, y'all, there's like secret magic. And now it's just like in a book that you can literally buy from a worker co-op and you can like study it and take what's useful and apply it. But um, so sweet. A few, uh, <laughs> I mean, I'm just telling true stories. Um, so, but it came from a moment where we were working with, and it wasn't the kind of, it wasn't the kind of, um, brokering or negotiation um, around oppositional groups. And this um, is relating to one of the questions that we'll get to, but thank you for putting that in the chat and please continue to pop things in the Q&A because that's a great question. We're absolutely getting to that. <laughs> I want to go there. Um, but it was around a new um, association or an alliance of a bunch of different organizations and stakeholders who were together trying to align on principles. I mean, and they had like a day and a half to gel as a group and decide like, what are our principles? Who are we? What do we stand for? What are our bylaws? Like whatever the things were. And they were from different sized organizations. Some were POC led, some were white led. I mean, it was like all over the place. And then I saw you do this thing that, and I was like, mm, what's going on? And it was, it was this focused, um, this focused and like connecting, really empathetic um, way that you locked in with somebody in particular when they said, and imagine it's like a constitutional convention. Those of you who are like, what, what is the, it what is was, the climate right? of this? Right, it was, right? It yeah. was like, here we are as architects of whatever this thing that we're building. And somebody said, well, I think it should be this way or I want such and such. And instead of saying, okay, how does that relate to what this other person asked for or what was proposed initially or whatever, which is what a lot of people, that's what I usually do. You were like, great, tell me about why. <laughs> tell me about your underlying interests. And you just kept doing follow-up questions and going deeper to be like, what is underneath your expressed request or what you're saying you desire to see reflected? Tell me what the actual need is What's your interest? Why do you have that need? What are you trying to get done? And is it about power? Is it about values? Is it about like the longevity or the sustainability? Is it because you showed up with marching orders from your, you know, your general manager or your board chair and you feel like you're just here to express that? Like, what is the thing? Is it about some anxiety about how our movements function generally and some skepticism of multiracial group dynamics? And is that why you're, right? So instead of just saying surface level, here's the proposal, let's work on it, negotiate it, take it or leave it, it was actually pausing all of that and saying, actually what's going on underneath that, um, which to me was the my first moment of realizing like there's a whole method, of, like she's doing something here and I don't know what it is, but it's, it's effective, it's working. And I was like, that was my lean in moment. I was like, okay, I need to, I really need to follow this person um, and find out more uh, about what it is that you're, I'm um, trying to do. So I'm wondering if you can, Tell us, like, who was your intended audience when you were writing this? Well, I want to say three things, and I don't know if I'm going to remember all of them, so I hope I do. The first thing I want to say is it's really fun to get that kind of, like, high praise from you, Esteban, because you're, you know, you're the facilitation master. <laughs> and you're so beautiful to be around doing it. And um, so I, it's fun to know that you were noticing something that I was doing that was really useful to you. I mean, I kind of knew that you thought that, but that's fun. So thank you. Um, the second thing is that, what was your question again? About the audience. Oh yeah. Right. The that's the third audience. thing I'm going to say. Right. Yeah. So the second thing is, um, that technique was interest. It was exploration of interests. It's related to 
the ladder of inference, a concept that, you know, in academic circles, people kind of throw around, people like to use it in psychology by a guy mm. called Chris Argerus, who was at MIT. And it's, it's incorporated into a framework for negotiating called famously as heck getting to yes by Roger right. Fisher and William Urey and Bruce Patton. And that stuff comes out of Harvard. And that's where, that's where I was trained in negotiation. Mm -hmm. And I think that if you have access to good ways of building a fence, because you go to fence builders and you go to fence building school, and you're going to do an action which requires a fence, you really want access to fence building school, right? Yeah, but on principle, if they have a history of, um, of like classes, enslaving people, um, yeah, yeah, then then maybe you just don't fuck with the fence building skills and you figure it out on your own. Maybe you don't. That was according to, to be my way of thinking. <laughs> right. According to my way of thinking, if it's going to get you what you want, you Take might want to think about it. You might want to think about it, and then you use a principle screen to determine whether it's okay for you. Oof, wait, unpack that term. What I say, a principal screen? Yeah, you did. Yeah, I did. I just kind of tossed it out there. So as I said to you, there are four factors, right, that I use in the book to describe what you might notice watching groups decide whether to talk or fight or vanquish. And they are, again, power and um, structural barriers and uh, principle and, and biases and inclinations. So when we look at principle, again, I don't say, hey, violence is okay, violence is not okay, property damage, right. or you should definitely, you know, whatever it is, what I say, you shouldn't build a fence. <laughs> uh, what I say is you should have some um, tools for evaluating your right. own principles. And yeah. so that's what I refer to as a principle screen. Oh, this is who's why the we needed a book audience? from you. Yeah. Okay. What's the last thing you said? Oh, just which is which is why we needed. You oh yeah. Write a book. <laughs> all right. So you, you've got all these footnotes in your head. You're like in movement spaces, but you're taking all this training from, um, from Harvard. And I mean, Doug Doug kind of mentions that in the in his forward, um, uh, the getting to yes stuff and um, right. and just some of that framework for ne negotiation and yeah. the, the sort of like wanted... sea change of moving out of a zero sum game into this more like expansive and, and world of potentiality through negotiation, which I appreciate. That's but the yes. thing that you just said. I'm interested in expanding what's possible for anybody who wants something good in the world. Boom, That's write all. that on your book jacket. That's all, I wanna just expand <laughs> what's possible. I want to yeah. make, make it possible for you, right? And. I kind of am chomping at the bit to, to respond to Juliana's question, um, which is related to that. But I, you asked, we'll get to it. Will you asked before what who the intended audiences are? Please. And there, I would say three. I mean, there. Anybody who wants to read the book, uh, who thinks that what I've just described is is interesting, and that so far I'm finding that there are a lot of people who may not be in social movements based negotiation space or anything, but who find it interesting because we all watch change happen. What's just, what just happened in Afghanistan? What's going on? You know, um, what, what, why did, you know, Bree Newsom climbed to the top of the flagpole state to the to state house in state South house. Carolina and took down the Confederate flag. Like what, let me understand why she did that. What was the, the strategy there? You know, like, a lot of people are interested in understanding people's choices of change making um, and talking or fighting better. But the three um, audiences that I've been most focused on are movement strategists um, for reasons that we've been describing, right? To make, to expand the range of possibilities to, ex to, to not even to offer more tools of talking or of fighting or of vanquishing, but to offer um, a framework through which people can imagine more possibilities 
for using the tools they already have or the tools that people have who they might not be connected with. So that's people in movement space. People in negotiating space see above, mm. um, but without a power analysis, um, I, I don't think that negotiation mm. is, is principled. Mm. Um, and wait, say what you mean by that, if you don't mind. Yeah. And, and I'm saying something, I just spent only like three words saying that, but I think the concept is something that we're all intuitively familiar with, Yeah, which is that, um, imagine, uh, well, I use the example of Israelis and, and Palestinians a whole bunch, right? So um, I think that it would be amazing someday for Palestinians and Israeli Jews to negotiate about a whole bunch of things, like how they're going to use the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and what language signs should be on in Palestine and things like that. I think that would be great. Um, but I think that negotiating at a time when the power is so imbalanced is is both um, strategically a bad idea because you're not going to have a durable agreement. In principle, it's not a good idea because some people are going to be more tyrannized. What's the word for that? Uh, Tyr tyrannized? Is there like a exploited treated very exploited? yeah i guess so tyrannized should be a word maybe um yeah because like bad things will happen to people as a result no. and that's on a macro level that's on a, on a micro level too to, to individuals who are you know th just think in 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 terms of gender um think of somebody who's got a down rank gender right who is trans who is a woman uh, negotiating with someone who is cis, who is a man. It, there are lots of other factors, but if all other things are equal and then mm -hmm. you have an unequalizer in, in situations of social conflict, you're trying to decide whether or not to, to, to chop off the top of a mountain, for example. It's not okay to negotiate in that setting. Right. I don't think it's principled and it's certainly not strategic. So that's the negotiation piece. And then the third set of people are um, students and teachers who are trying to make heads or tails out of a field called conflict management, um, out of a field called social change, where, um, and I say this from experiences, you said, Ash, you know, I taught at um, Westchester University for 15 years outside of Philadelphia. And, you know, we're teaching peace and conflict, and it's very hard to have a coherent course in a peace and conflict studies program when some people are there because their brother is in the military, and some people are there and, and they really want to understand military strategy. Some people are there because they want to meditate. I'm giving you some extremes. But what are the organizing principles of any conversation about conflict? this offers an organizing principle about conversations about conflict. Do you know, I, you, I don't know if you know this, uh, that I, I essentially minored in peace and conflict studies. I didn't know Berkeley. that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Those were, those were part of what would people. you say the organizing principles were or were there organizing principles mm. when you mm. talked about war, when you talked about social movements, Okay, so the two primary courses that I, um, or professors, because they I took multiple courses with them, but that were like running the show for peace and conflict studies out there were, um, well, Michael Nagler was kind of coming from like a, a Gandhian nonviolence. I mean, he literally like lived in an ashram and would like drive from Northern California down to campus <laughs> with the rest of us. And, um, and, and so he was like, mostly all about Kingy and nonviolence as an American sort of adaptation of what um, uh, Bayard Rustin had actually brought back from his visits to India, but, um, but was skeptical in how it had been sort of taken up by movements in the US because he made this strong distinction between principled nonviolence and strategic nonviolence. And for him, strategic nonviolence was, and they literally would like 
when do you have a dash in there versus when is it just one word nonviolence? We got into all the like himza versus ahimsa stuff around whatever, like what it means to be devoid of violence as opposed to um, like muting violence or something. Um, and so I, I think that his organizing principle that he was trying to impart with a lot of his stuff around was was really centering nonviolence in that way of like, what does it mean to be so um, present and compassionate that we, um, the temptation to even like need to resort to violence is like not even there and that you've like healed your traumas and done whatever your things are, right? So for both of them, I think they were coming from a bigger perspective in terms of like geopolitics and social movements. I mean, they weren't just thinking about like individuals on an ashram, like to give them credit. And it was Berkeley, everything was political economy. <laughs> that was like basically what we were doing. It was also Whereas not last year. It was also not last year. I mean, we're talking we're talking um, late '90s, early 2000s. Um, and uh, the other guy who really who taught the like intro to peace and conflict studies, you know, set, seminar that really framed it up, was introducing everyone else's worldviews and just mapping it for people, being like, "Here's what's going on with these like war hawk, you know, uh, here's what's going on with the neoliberal people. Here's what's going on when people are exerting." Um, like covert power and like CIA stuff or soft power in the like Samantha power, like let's just give them food and take in some refugees and make it makes us look good. And, you know, so we talked a lot about hegemony and, and some of those things. So, I, you know, I think it was a general framework that was trying to break down, like here's, there's no, there's no underlying truth of how the world works, but what you need to know, what y'all kids need to know is that there's a bunch of institutions and we studied a lot of the like Bretton Woods multinational institutions um, that govern the economy and that run the world. We studied the UN a bunch and you know the Declaration of Human Rights and all of that stuff. And they're like, the people who are running these institutions who shape the world, you all at least need to know how they think. And you need to realize that there is not as much of a consensus as they pretend there is. And this was as the Washington consensus was just beginning to fall apart, um, given you know 9-11 and, and all of that. So I think that's kind of where they were coming from. So here you have people whose message is about nonviolent. And there was one of the readers of the book actually told me that she would write um, she would write a blurb, but only if I didn't hyphenate nonviolence. So, right. <laughs> then most people have no idea that this is even a thing. <laughs> and then there's anyway, people who are like, ooh, with relevant, a hyphen. Right. <laughs> so um, you're describing conversations that are focused, as many conversations about conflict are, around um, methods and principle. Mm. And I wonder when you think about um, co-ops in movement space, not all co-ops are in movement space, right? That's for damn sure. <laughs> so of the co-ops who were like members of the US Federation of Worker Co-ops of which you were the executive director, how many would you say are in broadly defined movement space and how many are land of lakes? Unfair question. We are Facebook living. Um, it's funny, I was literally having a, a focus group session with one of our local organizer, uh, you know, local affiliates earlier today. <laughs> and I asked them that question. Um, and, and they I felt, said. <laughs> and, and I asked it knowing that it was unfair. Um, and here you are asking me the question. I don't know, I would say, I would say in movement space, like for real, um, I would say that it's probably a slight majority, honestly. I think that it's a lot higher for, for worker co-ops than for other co-op sectors. But in terms of like actively, like the ones who are like making propaganda and like designing posters and mobilizing people and like doing interpretation for the movement, blah, blah, blah. Yes, I think that that's, that's the definition of movement space right there. I mean, <laughs> right. That, that those groups are probably under, like well under 10% who are like actively, basically doing movement right. work as they're paid work. Yes. So um, I, the reason I ask that is because I'm thinking about um, the, I'm thinking about how building a co-op is both a column A activity, right? Because it's um, consensual, 
joint consensual activity to resolve, right, to sort of answer capitalism, respond to capitalism, right, joint consensual activity, but it's column B activity because it's, well, I don't know if it's column B, it's certainly column C activity, which is vanquishing, right, because you're also without the permission of mm. right. the system. Capital, yeah. Capital, without the permission of capital. Well, I don't want to say that because I don't know enough about how co-ops work. But without the permission of the big capitalist system, right. you're not being like, "Hey, should we have co-ops?" It's more of it's more of a, um, you know, you're you're just it's what you're talking about, right? <laughs> that. Column A, column B, column C, column D. Very nice. Vanquishing. Yes, this is from the book. This is. Do you see at the bottom there? dumpster fire i didn't tell you about yes. e, everybody because we don't have enough time to do that read the book um rosie greenberg invented the dumpster fire and i think it's brilliant it's sort of a suggestion that there would be a column d um which is when um the second factor that groups use in determining whether to talk or fight which is structural barriers obscures the possibilities of doing something that is strategic and principled and unbiased um there might still be utility there but anyway that's an aside i'm just thinking about co-ops as uh, both a column a and a column c activity and how on earth does that relate to a conversation like you might have had as an undergrad about violence and nonviolence? like what do these things have to do with each other and to me that's that's at the core of the book right it's like we may use column A, column B, column C activities. It's important to pay attention to what the power relations are, our power relations, which are at the core of strategy. Um, are, you, are, you able to, are you able to use a, a um, strategy as your primary determinants of what you're gonna do? Um, where do structural barriers fit in? Have you used a principal screen to make sure that it's in line with your own values, the values of your group, what you say you stand for? And are you thinking clearly? Are you able to make sure that you are showing up um, where you should be showing up based on the other factors, or are you biased toward one thing or another? And so it's just, it, it all sort of like fits into the model. And so that's the answer to one of your first questions, which is it's really not there to tell people what they should do, but it's there to help people to um, have a new frame, a new um, set of specs um, through which to see what they're already doing and what others are already doing. That, that yeah, that um, that's also resonating because I'm I'm remembering that one of the other professors in that department was um, Laura Nader, uh, who is the sibling of Ralph Nader, Nader, who many of our participants this evening are probably more familiar with. And so she taught a course called Controlling Processes. Uh, which I did not take. I was told that I didn't necessarily need to. Um, but it really is looking at this, like, what's all the invisible shit that is shaping our lives? And I, I'm sure some of it looked at the very explicit stuff. Um, but like controlling processes, a gender reveal party. Well, who's the family? Who are the parents who are imposing this gender binary on literal like newborns um, or kids who aren't even born yet? Um, they, they start the course with um, reading... 1984 and Animal Farm, I think side by side, and like, or um, the other one, not Animal Farm, uh, the other Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, um, and you oh, sort of like Aldous compare Huxley those, and yeah, George Orwell, right? Yeah, so you you sort of compare like, oh, what does hegemony look like in these two different, you know, foundational texts, and what's useful about science fiction, which is my world, is how it sort of reveals. <laughs> Uh, it by making it absurd and making it strange, um, it just makes it so clear like what's happening and what a strange thing it is. And then you like you put the Love book down, that. you look around, and you're like, oh yeah, cool. That's like exactly what Fox News and MSNBC yes. and uh, Newsweek are all doing. Um, so, but that's how she structured it. And I I, I like um, the parallels between that and what you were just saying about like how the point is to reveal what are the underlying structures. Um, how is power flowing? And then how does how does even having some consciousness and awareness about that help to inform your strategies Beautiful. and tools for how you then navigate? Beautiful. The world? Beautifully put. 
I had a I had a final question before um, I think we need to close out this section and move to Q and A. Yeah, is that okay? Got a couple good questions here. We yeah, we sure we Teed certainly do. For us. Yeah. Um, I just I just I want to go back to Palestine. Um, I mean. I want to go back me, to Palestine. Put me on a plane. Too. Why not? <laughs> uh, I've actually never been, so um, it it <laughs> it would be a first time for me. But um, yeah, you make the case for BDS, and it, I'm wondering: is there a way in which that weakens your argument that sometimes um, that it's sometimes time to talk? Like what? Like how are you, how are you thinking about? some of those strategies and campaigns in relation to the, the choices that we have about talking versus dialogue and some of what you were saying earlier about the power differentials and, and that assessment. Where do you locate yourself within that, in other words? Well, interestingly, um, there are two things about the way that I tell the story, um, uh, that I make the case, as you say, for boycott, divestment, and sanction movement um, targeting Israel. Um, a movement that was started by Palestinians um, and that many allies around the world support. Um, the way that I make that case is not so much by advocating for boycott as it is for it is the test case that I use um, to take the mo you know to take take through the model and. Mm. Um, I use it specifically because um, biases, I believe, tend to skew the choices that the population in, in that study in the book, which are US Jews who are opposed to the Israeli occupation, right? So among US Jews who are opposed to the Israeli occupation of Palestinians are people who support boycott and people who oppose it and support primarily negotiation. Right. And I feel like it's biases above all that make people in the end make those choices. And in the stories in chapter nine of the book where, where I go through this whole Palestine BDS section, um, there's a lot of emotion from me Right. And so I'm trying to use that right. as a model for what happens when, if I'm able to become aware of myself, like you were saying a few minutes ago, and what, you know, Aldous Huxley are like, I don't read any. I mean, I used to read Ray Bradbury. That's about it. I don't, I don't read science fiction. They're turning the foundation trilogy into a movie or an Amazon Prime, Prime show or something. You don't know what I'm talking about. I do. Isaac Asimov. I do. I do actually. Um, but I, it's so far from me, but Barbary, my partner might want to watch it. Probably not. If she did, I'd watch it. That's the only thing that turns me on that. Um, on principle factor number three. Mm. Um, but I, the, but uh, factor number, factor number four biases, we try to, I, I say my, orientation, if I'm answering your question right, is to try to raise awareness, try to raise a group's awareness of itself, of its own biases, try to raise my awareness of my own biases. And so of that, its own power, no? What's that? Sometimes our groups don't recognize what their own power is. Absolutely. And so um, I tie that to um, W.E.B. Du Bois for consciousness and um, some psychologist whose name I keep forgetting, um, a white woman who talks about how um, attention follows power. And, um, mm. you know, about how we don't necessarily, we might have biases toward thinking of ourselves as downrank, thinking of ourselves as the less powerful in a, spe right. in a certain um, exchange. And that comes up in the boycott chapter a lot. It's like, What's our understanding of the Israeli government as powerful or not powerful? Is our understanding of the, do we skew our interpretation of facts? Do we skew our analysis of power between Israeli Jews and Palestinians because we need it to fit a paradigm that suits our emotions, right? Do we 
it and the and so the 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 piece the W.E.B. Du Bois piece is because I am up rank, I am unable to perceive certain things that yeah. people who are down rank see inevitably. It's physics. So that's where I'm coming from is an increase in awareness helps us make those determinations. And I don't, I, my wishes to have awareness of my biases so that I can turn <laughs> to people who are really good at fighting when it's time to fight. And I can look to people who are really good at building co-ops and negotiating when that's what the moment calls for. I just put co-ops in, in column A for a minute. I just did it to see what would happen. Well, I think, well, and I also think it fits in with the other thing around power dynamics. You know, co-ops are a tool for us to build up a source of economic power um, so that we can, I mean, we're still nowhere near being able to go toe to toe, but Jesus, without them, <laughs> we're just obliterated by corporations, Wall Street, um, even the, you know, the Pentagon and their capital, right? Um, so given a power analysis or an analysis of power dynamics or an assessment um, of it, uh, movements, it should become pretty clear like, oh, why are we fighting for a return of land to black farmers or to indigenous people? Like maybe it's because there's like, you know, 50 hedge funds <laughs> managers who basically control or the Gates family <laughs> has like- Who owns you know, everything. Yeah, they own like 20% of all the private farms in this country or some nonsense. Like, you know, may maybe maybe if we're actually trying to fight for um, a different- future um, and the kind of, to have the kind of power it takes to shape the world, maybe just maybe we actually need some economic power and not just like moral high ground, which is where we are powerful and where we are And winning. that is a wonderful example of the kind of brazenness or bravery or chutzpah to use the Yiddish word is that's really handy, right? In building power. And it's like, oh, what would it be like if we created businesses with a different business model. And the idea of using business and business models is it's just like a perfect example of something that that many of us have biases against. Yeah. Um, and then we leave all of this value on the table as the negotiators exactly. say. Ooh, can we go to these people's questions that it's are time. coming here, yeah. people? Because you're beautiful with your questions and I'm excited about them. Uh, would you like me to read them out? Yeah. Is that helpful? Um, great. So the first one, well, actually, do you have a preferred order? Is one of them? Yeah, like... the order that came in and seems good. Great. So let's do Juliana's question, which is, uh, one of the major issues, I'm just going to parrot it's first person. I'm not going to change it. <laughs> that seems wise. Uh, one of the major issues I come up against in working with activists is the tendency for conflict to arise among them regarding distinct strategies and analyses, and for very fierce condemnation between different schools of thought. Can you comment on the question of fighting and talking amongst activists who are basically all part of the same movement for a just society, but who condemn each other so ferociously? That is the question. Thank you, Juliana. Truly. Yeah, so... This is where a lot of my energy around how the book gets rolled out at this moment in 2021 goes. Um, my colleagues at Dragonfly and I, and often we work with Esteban and his colleagues at the US Federation of Worker Co-ops, um, are frequently um, social change organizations, often nonprofits, who are in transition. And the transition is to a greater racial justice consciousness. And many of them are white led, not all of them. Um, and often the dynamics internally in the organization and many of our movement spaces are that um, people of color notice that it is possible in this moment to call attention to injustice and inequities and be heard in ways that they might not have been heard before. White people are called upon to show up and 
like pay more attention to microaggressions, be more leaderly rather than lead, leading leadership for racial justice to people of color. And as a result, there are expectations that are raised and there are um, aspirations that are held. Um, and when they're dashed or when people feel that the other, somebody else isn't doing as much as they could do or isn't doing it the way that they want them to do it, the fierceness of people's emotions around that, and we all know that, right, are just, are just so heightened. And the lateral oppression, the like, the way that, as you described, Juliana, I see, we see activists on each other is heartbreaking. And um, the way that I would speak describe that heartbreaking dynamic in terms of the model from the book is that frequently inside column B, inside the space where people are have come together to do unilateral uh, non-consensual activity, right? Changing the world without the permission of those who hold down the status quo. Inside that there has to be a lot of column A activity, right? Inside that there has to be a lot of joint consensual work. And the assumption we make is, as you say, Juliana, is that we are um, more or less equals inside movement space. But then a few dynamics happen. We're not always equals inside movement space. And sometimes we are equals in movement space and we mistake ourselves for not being equals. Now, the first instance is um, they're, they're quite different dynamics from each other, but I want to talk about that second instance, which is the question that you raise, which is when in fact we have more or less equal power and could be working things out between us, but we use the skills that we're accustomed to using, right? We have these biases toward column B. We have a column B bias or column, column BC bias. We have a bias toward unilateral activity. We believe it's our, it's our, instinct it's our skill it's our best and favorite skill right is organizing so we like we'll go to each other thinking that each other is the enemy thinking yeah. that each other is the uprank right and our best skills are like how to relate to people who are uprank from us and um esteban i'm gonna show this i can show another graph uh well the story your the your answer so far and this question is like the one thing that I contributed to this book, which was exactly that, right? Like my Tell anecdote, it. my anecdote from the forward um, was just, was about, um, it wasn't even like we within movements, it literally was like a cooperative association, not the worker co-op federation, by the way, um, where there was a queer caucus and a people of color caucus um, made up of individuals from within the sort of like diversity of members who were like, y'all, here's what needs to change. And this is like 20 years ago. And they proposed a bunch of things and they were rebuffed. And they were like, what the fuck, you guys? <laughs> we're literally we're literally giving you the plan. It was a plan for inclusion with like 13 points as clearly stated as you. it wasn't even like, we're doing a sit-in and we're pissed off at you. It literally was like, hi everyone, we had some meetings. Here's some suggestions about what needs to change, including access to power on the board of directors, um, uh, putting us in the front of the room to deliver content in our conferences, keynotes, et cetera, um, and some bylaw changes, yada, yada. And um, they were so disheartened when the, um, the, the white people who had the authority to cast the votes on behalf of their very diverse organizations, by the way, they, all, they, <laughs> they were all represented by the white people who were present, who were like, no. Um, and it, it really pissed people off and was disheartening. And so their initial instinct was to fight. They were like, well, let's drag them out. Let's, I mean, whatever it was. And it was, it was not only that, it was also um, uh, what, what you're saying, Rebecca, about, I'm um, gonna try to use your language here, like about self-identifying as, overly identifying as being like down rank. And so they were like, well, we're gonna do one last fight 
and it wasn't negotiation and talk and woo them and educate and whatever organize it really was like how do we fight and they were like and if that doesn't work we're just gonna we're just gonna drop out right it was like well we don't have we don't see ourselves as having agency all we can do is holler protest show up with a sign and if we're not listened to then we just recede into the, and maybe this has other echoes, right, of what was happening in the early 2000s. This happened with the um, direct action to stop the war and a lot of the anti-war uh, protests, especially around the invasion of Iraq. Um, this happened, I mean, this happened all over again with all the, with the women's march. It was like, you get out there, the Muslim ban, whatever, you get out there with your signs and in a liberal framework, if you're not being listened to, then it's like, okay, suddenly then the movement like loses steam and people feel dispirited and go away, right? Um, and so my, my forward is really telling the story of um, even though I was young, I mean, this was 20 years ago. So I was, I was a fairly young organizer. I was like, y'all, this is, we're not talking about the Pentagon. We're not talking about George Bush. We're literally exactly. just talking about a cooperative organization that has democratic structures, values and principles. and we can actually point out how they are out of alignment with their own yes. principles of solidarity and cooperative education and you know, concern for community and yada, yada. Dem this is anti-democratic things that they're doing here. Let's show them. And also along the way, these are white people who don't understand the power that they hold and how they can wield it and leverage it. Like they really, there really was this sense within cooperatives, like because their story, the, the white people who were um, obstructionist, um, their story was, well, we're all self-actualized, cooperative, like democratic, whatever. And so I get to vote however I want based on my feelings or my understanding or my opinion or my analysis of what's happening. And to me, having people of color on the board and legislating that feels like a quota and it feels like that whatever they were saying. So my intervention was <laughs> to just like pause and actually like take it out of the general assembly and just go and meet with them. And I did workshops that were educational and they were followed up by chill, you know, happy hour discussions where we would chat and I would be like, so do you see what we're doing here? Do you see how this actually, like I did a whole education moment. I don't care if you actually understand institutional structural white supremacy and the legacy of that. At a certain point, the, the bottom line, I gave you that opportunity to understand that shit. The bottom line is if you still, if that was too quick for you, it's overwhelming. You're like just waking up to this stuff in 2003 or whatever that's fine. You still are holding the power. So instead of it's misidentifying, it's, right. It's instead of abstaining, instead of abstaining, or instead of saying, well, I'm voting out of my own self-interest, literally you have a bunch of queer people and people of color who are saying, here's what you need to do, whether or not you understand it, please be a good fellow or ally or accompany, accompany us be in solidarity and just do the thing, trust us, <laughs> do the thing that we're saying needs to happen because otherwise it does feel uncooperative. And this whole thing we're trying to do is like not working. And by the way, your board's all white. So like your membership is not all white. Your membership is quite diverse. Your board's all white. There's a problem. Do you see that there's a problem, right? And at a certain point, switching tactics and being able to sit down and it got through to them, um, to enough of them. And we, we far surpassed the majorities we needed. Um, do you think to, that was a misestimate? And I love that story. Do you think that that was a misestimation of um, a, a misestimation of the power difference? It was a misestimation of it was like they have this official power. Yes. And we have we don't have that official power. And therefore, it might as well be this. I think so. And I think that it's also because within movement spaces, there's a lot of misestimation that happens and a lot of, and it goes in a lot of different directions. It's not one pattern, right? So there's, there's like people who have a victim complex that don't need to, there, you know, there's a lot of things that happen. In this instance, I think that the misestimation was, we didn't realize, and it's what I tapped into, the power of saying, here is the gift you have, which is that you have people of color who are literally saying, the step is this easy. The thing we're asking for is not for you to like, write a treatise on the real cause of the civil war or like to like go on an apology tour to like every person of color you've ever worked with. We're literally just saying, vote this way. <laughs> That's literally it. That's literally it. So it's and possible to use column A 
for your ends. As a matter of fact, it's more likely that you're going to get what you want that way, but you're so accustomed to a certain approach. Yes. There's and 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 to, and like so directly to Ju Juliana's point, it's like it's so ordinary. Yeah. For for that kind of lateral, what I think of as lateral oppression, but we used to call it like old feministness lateral oppression when like lesbian organizations would just I was gonna say eat their own, but that was. And right. it turns out that the origins of all of this were um, the right wing talking points from the '90s that were so hegemonic, so pervasive that they filtered into um, the oh, you know upper whatever upper middle class managerial class white um youth i mean we're talking about kids who are like 18 19 20 years old um and not just in the us but in in especially in a, in southern ontario which is where a lot of those members were up in canada um and were especially the canadians were the most conservative the most like the people in texas and california were like y'all let's go but the folks up there, they were like, oh, no, we're just trying to be polite and follow the protocol. And this feels like it's, nah, nah, nah. and it, it was like Rush Limbaugh was in the room with us. We were like, what are you talking about? <laughs> they were like, oh, well, then if we give power to this group, then That's what about really the other group? And they started getting into all of that. We were like, no, no, no. This isn't even you talking. You know we're what literally it is? just parroting it's, it's, what you hear from the world. Keep your eyes on the prize. Yeah. Rather, yeah. Right. Um, should we take this next uh Yes, we Question. should. Um, it is from Daniel Park, and um, Daniel's asking for you. Do these ideas apply on the level of interpersonal as well? When to talk and when to fight as a queer relationship conflict framework? Question mark. And actually, that question came up when you were starting to talk about um, gender and power in in smaller and more intimate spaces. So. Uh, um, I think you were starting to to talk about this, but we wanted to save Q and A. So maybe let's circle back to that. Can what are your, some of your thoughts on that? Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, Daniel, that's a really good question. So the point of the book is is about groups. It's really like that's the landing place, that's the home base of it. Um, but we come to certain things. I come to certain things in the book from individual relationships. So for example, like why do people have different biases? Biases are sometimes held by groups, but they're sometimes held by individuals and groups are an amalgam of a bunch of people who sometimes don't share biases, but frequently do share biases because that's the nature of groups. So there are a couple places in the book where I take, especially about, you know, about tendency choices, biases, where I, I take all these um, examples uh, or, you know, sort of frameworks and philosophies of, um, individual bias and then blow them up into group biases. And then there's another place where I do that, which is in our understanding of power relations. And um, that's um, both because of the fact that there is no group that doesn't have complex internal power dynamics. There is no group that is wholly a group of equals. That's just, there's no such thing. Um, and so you have to understand the internal dynamics. Um, but it's also because um, it's also because we um, we come to our biases through, like we were just talking about, misestimations of power, and we come to misestimation of power from our biases, and those two things always implicate an individual. Um, when we're talking about um, how much structural power a group has, um, it's easy to talk about it as a group. When we're talking about how, and there are chapters where I define power and talk about um, measuring power, and I use Pokemon as an example. And Daniel, I think it was you who was telling me something about, about um, Dungeons and Dragons and the way that um, there are... Uh, objective metrics of power in in D and D. Oh yes. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh, well, here's another one that knows about Dungeons and Dragons, um, but I don't. But I know something about Pokemon, so I use that right. And so we're sort of using these models for how um, resource power is held and how it's measured. And without looking at individuals, it's very hard to uh, to have a good understanding of resource power. Um, 
potential power, it's the flip side of mo mobilized power, that we look at in terms of groups. But since there are these two different things, biases and power, that we do use individual examples and, and, and sort of theory to understand, um, it's very easy to then impute back onto individual conflict from the model. I do think that, that it's legitimate to do that in a lot of, to, to a great degree. I fought it for a long time. I was like, no, this is only about groups. This is only about groups, but it's not. And I have to say that my colleagues in Dragonfly and lots of other people that I know and a few people who've now read the book use column A and column. This one person, the mom of, are you on this call? Because I want to say this <laughs> differently if you are on this call. <laughs> no, you're not. Right. So somebody came to a conversation they had about the book um, earlier, one talk that we had before this, and um, she really enjoyed the book and she enjoyed the conversation. And afterwards, she sent me a note saying, my partner's a fighter and I'm a talker and blah, 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 and ask me a question. And I'm like, Oof. no, it doesn't apply in that way. Yeah. Groups are fighters and groups are talkers. Some of the principles can be applied. Um, is this a queer relationship conflict framework? Wonderful question. No, I don't think it is. I'm not an expert on individual relationships. I know about groups and organizations. I know about social movements. Um, I did a lot of research uh, with psychologists to learn more. Um, about individual psychology in order to in order to build out the piece of the model that's about biases. But there there is something that there is a um, there is something that's fractal about it. In other words, if you click down into a smaller pattern of the same sort of dynamics, where um, even before the book came out, just some of the frameworks that I've absorbed from you, Rebecca, I've ended up using in um, not in like personal relationships, but in uh, conflict resolution among uh, housemates who are fighting or coworkers who are in in conflict, um, and and whether it's me saying it and being like, "Here's what's going on," or whether it's me sort of like thinking about your witchcraft and being like, "Hey, what's actually going on there?" Or how you're not in a place where you're ready to negotiate and resolve this. One of you is still you need you still need a vent. You're still too angry, and so like let's actually just note that. And as a facilitator, let me give some space for that or let me create a, a helpful container for that so you're not just like blasting at this Love person that. so like what is the thing to get you to a place and to not presume like we're going to be able to resolve or talk through something when that's not the state that you're at so let I it means I need to do work to get you to the place where you're finally able to do that and now we're able to say I love here's that. what I need here's what I'm able to offer I I I, I think that's valid I think I, I mean I think it's it's valid to connect that to the model but I would push back on the idea that it's fractal because it 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 isn't yeah. necessarily the case yeah. that all of the things in the model apply on an individual level. That's true. So I would That's hesitate true. about that. Yeah. That's true. It's more molecular. There's molecules that make up a anyway. <laughs> um I hope that's not a last, a late breaking question because I think we're out of time. Is that a question or is that just yes, there is a question. Helpful response. Hmm. I'm going to read it and then you're going to make a decision yeah. about what we do. And okay. then Ash is going to come back on video in a moment. So um, this is also from Juliana who says, thanks for the answer. I look forward to reading the book. I know there isn't time, but I would love to know if the book or some other resource you can suggest looks at these questions in regard to socialists, communists, and other left-wing social change groups who often consider one, one another enemies. Julia, we need, Juliana, we need to connect, okay, friends? <laughs> this, is, this is what I talk about in my like signal messages with friends. Um, and viciously fight among themselves, even when there is not much race or class, i.e. structural power differential. Or is there? Again, thanks. First of all, you know, you can make a choice to like not look at Twitter as much. Because in the <laughs> real world, it's not happening to turned up to a 10, you know, it's not necessarily happening at that level. Most of it is happening on Twitter, but, um, but not exclusively. I don't want to like overly simplify. Um, what do you think? 
I think that, I mean, there, there's, I never look at Twitter <laughs> says the question asker. Good. So I, I want to, I want to say um, to your foundational question, which is if the book or some other resource looks at these questions in regard to socialist communists and other left-wing social change groups, there are examples in there um, of left-wing social change groups. I would say that I don't know another resource that looks at this question in quite this way, but I, I want to ask the sort of second order, which really is the first order question, which is, um, or is there, <laughs> right? You're like, okay, so uh, what are the power differences between the, the different um, groups that you're talking about? And I would say there are, first of all, there's more than structural power, right? There's resource power and and, the, and and there is potential power. And I would say that um, there is either a misestimation of power when people are fighting each other um, across groups that share politics, right? There's sort of like a misestimation that really the groups are more equal than um, like we were talking about before, right? And so people sort of misestimate their position as downranked to the other groups. But there is also, um, I think, and this is reflected in the book very much, um, that, and you know, you say these are all my comrades, I want them to get along. Um, I would just say that this is, I, I, I would start my diagnosis at biases. I would just, you know, yes, a misestimation of power, but probably like in the example of um, boycott of Israel, uh, um, a sort of nasty cycle between a misestimation of the power relations and a bias towards certain methods that makes you see the power relations a certain way. And when you see the power relations a certain way, you know, you may have uh, corresponding biases about about and what I'll, methods and I'll answer questions. the other part of the question um, before Ash comes on to, to boot us off, which is uh, one, uh, there have been a lot of episodes. Um, I don't know if you're familiar, um, Juliana, with this podcast called The Dig, um, The Dig Podcast, which is run by Daniel Denver, who used to be a journalist in Philadelphia and is now in um, Providence, Rhode Island. Um, but there are so many, so many episodes that explore exactly this with the level of nuance and rigor of the conversation that we just had. Um, so that's one resource. And there's like the eco-socialists and DSA and the tankies. And the, I mean, they're like exploring it really from this perspective of class solidarity and like, what are we actually building? Um, and Femi, a lot of the episodes with with Femi and, uh, um, uh, and other like black Marxists, the way that they enter that and navigate that conversation is I, I think instructive. Um, that's one. Another is Adrian Marie Brown just put out like the teeny tiniest book called We Will Not Cancel Us that, that explores, um, especially at a smaller scale, this level of like, what are we actually doing around conflict in different ways? Um, there's more kind of in that series that explores um, versions of that, but that's, um, that's a, a, another good resource on this. And, um, and lastly, um, I don't know, exactly a year ago, last August, the end of last August, the Movement for Black Lives put on what was, it was after the RNC and the DNC, they put on the Black National Convention. And it was all remote and it was on Zoom. And the, one of the most beautiful moments, it's still recorded, you can find it online, you can Google it. Um, but throughout it, one of the moments that happened was people came together and they said, you know, we just had this like heated primary fight where we were endorsing different candidates. Some of us were like, fuck the whole electoral system. Some were like super down with Bernie. Some were like, had endorsed Elizabeth Warren, like all over the place, right? And at a certain point, just seeing people come together and be like, hi, let's talk about that. And instead of leaning in and being like, here's what my stance was, it they were like, ultimately, that's some white people shit. Like, like we actually have so much love and solidarity and we don't, we don't dispose of each other because of that level of kind of political fights and how we might land in a different place in terms of that world. Ultimately, we understand our, uh, our racial and class-based solidarity as, as black um, visionary organizers for our emancipation <laughs> and seeing the way that they ha handled that conversation. I, I don't know that I've ever kind of seen that happen in such a public way. And I was like, 
that's right. These are my people. <laughs> and it also helped me with my feelings about my leftover feelings about that, that particular primary. So I think that that's part of the, the answer is like how we hold those things together. Um, and I think we have to leave it there. Yeah, that was, that was a really uh, great place to, to finish off. And thanks for that answer there, Esteban. Um, for folks who are still here, um, and you know, all of, there were numerous resources that got named. Um, if you registered for this event, uh, there will be a follow-up email with a recording of the event. So I think we heard a really robust and informative conversation tonight, and it won't be the last time you have to hear it. There'll be the recording. So consider this a future resource. Um, and I'm sure people who watch in the future as well will get as much as I did out of it tonight. Um, yes, I've got the book as well, <laughs> holding it up here. If folks are interested, I dropped a link again in the chat to the book, when to talk and when to fight. Uh, thank you to all the uh, audience members who are here tonight, uh, submitting really engaging questions through Liana. I was twinkling my fingers and snapping along with all those questions as well, because that was on my mind very much. Um, so Rebecca, you might anticipate that activists and organizers, as you continue to go on a book tour to talk about this, will be considering those questions. Um, and thank you so much, Esteban, for being here tonight, participating in this conversation, and Rebecca, the book is wonderful, um, and wish you the best on what comes next. Thank you so much. Thank you to everybody who has participated by listening, by being here, by the book from Firestorm Books and Coffee. All right. Thanks so much. You rock. Yep, thank you. Have a good you night. Rock. Bye. Thanks Thank so you much. <laughs> good night, everybody.